Thing. So uh, welcome everyone. You should see on your respective devices um, a prompt just telling you that uh, I'm now uh, recording the call, which will save me from having to write furiously um, whilst we're talking. Uh, so welcome to our last call for this uh, uh, year. Um, you hopefully saw our main theme for today will be DNS um, over quick. Um, and just in case you haven't had a chance to see it, let me put up on the screen if I can share this. So this is what prompted uh, that that focus. So uh, AdGuard um, announced the first DNS over quick resolver uh, last week. Um, there you can see that's this is their blog post which if you've got the uh, weekly uh, sort of press sort of update, you'll see a link in there um, to it. So I'll leave you to read that at your leisure. Um, but that made it quite topical to uh, share, uh, to, to focus on DNS over quick today. Um, and um, um, Vinny um, Parler from uh, Cisco um, uh, happened by chance to contact me on, I think it was Friday, Vinny, um, so highlighting that, that Cisco had a view um, on uh, DNS over quick. So it seemed like a sort of perfect opportunity to share that and, and take to take, take the chance to uh, just highlight that DNS over quick is now a thing. Um, so in terms of agenda for today, um, uh, Vinny will uh, sort of take us through some slides um, outlining um, his thoughts on uh, DNS over quick and some related uh, matters. Um, we'll sort of have a sort of Q&A on that uh, and then pick up on some um, other um, topics uh, uh, after that has finished. Um, so without further ado, firstly, let me introduce uh, Vinny. So if you, uh, um, if, you, if you want to say hello, Vinny, and I will put your slides up uh, on the screen. Sure. At the same so, time. I, so I'm Vinny Parla. I hope all of you can hear me. Uh, I work in the security CTO office at Cisco and uh, provide advisory services to our security business. And um, this is actually a culmination of, of several topics that uh, myself and Robbie Grew, who uh, is in our Umbrella DNS organization at Cisco, helped uh, put together. Um, so it'll cover a, a little bit of background in addition to DNS over quick. Um, a few of you may have seen some of my uh, inquisitive email probes on uh, some of the IETF mailer lists asking about specifically around the topic of uh, DNS and content being multiplexed together. And, uh, you know, what sort of the plans are, because ultimately it comes down to what, what are people going to actually implement in endpoint devices and such. And so I've kind of been probing at that uh, for a little while here because I, I do see it really changing the landscape in terms of uh, the view from, from network operators perspective. And my focus on network operators here is really more like enterprise networks and guest networks and such, uh, hotel networks, those sort of things versus like an ISP network. But you can see a similar sort of set of, of issues coming down the pike uh, for those networks as well. You can advance to the, to the slide. I'll go through these quickly. It's really just to get folks to, to think about the problems more than to prescribe any solutions. Um, so go ahead and advance, yeah. So first, just to state, Cisco's position is a, we're very strong proponents of end-to-end -end encryption. In fact, uh, Umbrella's been doing DNS crypt since 2011 and offering those services to customers. Um, our observation is that current IETF standards uh, and the actual implementations um, are not supporting some important use cases that our customers care about. And I also just want to point out, the, you know, it's pretty obvious, but device owners and network owners are often different entities. So you can't 
simply say, well, manage the device. Like that may not be an option in many conditions. Guest networks are a great example of that. Uh, go ahead. So classical DNS, uh, you essentially have two parties involved. You have the, the client that can define a DNS resolver to use, and then you have the network that can advertise a DNS resolver. Uh, go ahead, next slide. Filtering today is essentially, even if a user selects uh, a DNS resolver to use because that as an artifact of that traffic being unencrypted, networks can apply policy controls. Um, and really it, it becomes a, you know, my network, my policy decision point um, with classic DNS. Next slide. Um, and DNS often is really the last line of defense against malicious activity. So, um, you know, the solar winds uh, exploits are a great example. A lot of that CNC traffic was observed by DNS filtering security systems and blocked those uh, requests from going out and help uh, customers in their enterprises to defend against this attack. Next slide. So encrypted DNS, as we all know, is sort of changing the landscape here. Um, the biggest change here now is that it's not as straightforward for a network operator to enforce their policies, right? A user can select a, a DOE server, for example, in their browser, and um, the network operator, if they don't approve of that, really are left with sort of a whack-a-mole approach of blocking DOE services. And that just leads to an arms race between users and the network operator um, so when you're on that network, if the network operator doesn't want you to access those services, they're just going to block those, those services. Next slide. So what really changes all of this is the multiplexing of DNS with content that is really going to make it very difficult for network operators to enforce any sort of policies. So while today the, there is you know, a finite list of, of DOE servers that are well known and, and that's a sort of definable list and they can block those as a policy decision. Uh, you can't do that, go ahead, next slide. You, you can't do that in, in the case where you're multiplexing DNS and content because you can't simply block an entire CDN, right? So when a single uh, quick channel is going to a CDN, uh, uh, point in the network, all of that traffic is just going to be encrypted and you're not going to be able to distinguish between content or DNS. And it's really going to create a, a difficult situation for network operators to apply policies. So an enterprise is an example. Um, they're not going to be able to distinguish between CDN delivered content and CDN delivered DNS. Next slide. Uh, Right now, adaptive and DIR are pretty uh, hot topics in uh, IETF, and those uh, systems as well don't really offer a great solution where the device owner and network owner can resolve conflicts. So if the preferences of the device owner are different than the network owner, there's really no way to resolve that, and there's really no way the user is notified of this, and they just aren't going to get connectivity and it's really up to the devices as to the fallback behavior. Um, so what's really lacking there is something similar to a captive portal workflow where you join the network and uh, go ahead next slide. Sorry. So, so the cryptographic analogy here is you know in cryptography you have a client and server exchange proposals and a mutually accepted selection is made from those proposals. And so the question here is, you know, could encrypted DNS be made to work in a similar manner for the device and network where they could exchange proposals? And then when a mutual agreement cannot be made, provide a way for a user to make a choice. So that user could choose to accept the network proposals and continue their network connection 
very similar to like a captive portal uh, workflow, or they could choose just not to join that network because they find it unacceptable. Next slide. So in, in our view, what's missing really is this mutual consent model. Um, and we feel it would be better if there was a solution that was more closely modeled to the way captive portals work. So when you join a Wi-Fi network, you typically get a captive portal prompt as to the policies of that network. It would be great if we could incorporate the DNS selection into this sort of a mechanism such that uh, if the user has a set of preferences and the network has a set of preferences and there's a match, great, it just goes along seamlessly and they, they don't have to prompt. But if there is that conflict, they can prompt and let the user make a, uh, a decision. Go ahead, next slide. And this sort of just talks about it at a high level where uh, the device determines if it can proceed without any further consent. And then when that conflict arises, the user is prompted to accept the proposed network settings or opt out of using the network. And in that way, both the network policies are uh, able to be applied and the user is able to agree to those policies. Next slide. Uh, similarly, when we talk about multiplexing of DNS and content, it's going to really move the, the problem space towards the content provider and the CDNs. And I think we're going to have to come up with some sort of mechanism to apply a service chain policy for that network provider. So you could, for example, use the egress IP address and then apply the, so if it's coming from say Cisco's network, apply Cisco's policies to that content um, and then go ahead, next slide. And then a way to inform the user that those sort of policy enforcements from that service chain are being applied. And uh, again, this is just sort of thought provoking idea, but it's, it, you know, when these two things ultimately get multiplexed, and I think that is inevitable, there's going to have to be some way to for enterprises to continue to apply their policy. And while there's things like CASB today, the APIs are not well defined on the back end SaaS systems. So, you know, CASB solutions constantly having to change, chase those APIs whereas a more formally defined service chain mechanism might be a better approach there. Go ahead, next slide. And that's it. That's all I had to cover today very quickly. Uh, the rest of the slides in backup are actual real world use cases. So I discuss examples like when a user brings their device onto uh, your favorite coffee shop network and that coffee shop wants to apply policies like no adult content, on their network, um, it's not really going to be feasible to do with both DOE and DOC um, moving forward without some changes uh, and more collaborative security. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, uh, Vinny. Um, <laughs> I can see already. Sorry if I went through that kind of quickly, but I wanted to make sure we had time to talk, which is what's more important here. Well, it looks like well, certainly Chris seems to have appreciated the uh, slides from looking at the chat. Uh, so uh, positive comments. Uh, uh, so uh, what, what questions is that or observations is that throw up with uh, people in terms of sort of views on whether the, that that's a, a good approach or do you think there are some clear downsides with it? Um, anyone got any thoughts you want to share? I think Vinny framed it really well, much like Chris said, this is a great way of explaining the problem. Uh, the, the question is, is, is still, how do we solve this problem? Um, you know, blocking resolution or blocking, yeah, blocking those external services can only take you so far, much like you say, when it's, uh, when it's mixed with other things on the same site, uh, there's not a, I, I have yet much like you to see a solid answer on how to resolve that problem. Um, I had thought we were going an entirely different way with this particular presentation, so. Sorry. Uh, no worries. Um. Yeah, I, I definitely don't have the answers. Um, I, I was mainly trying to just raise the, the topics and 
where I see it going. I definitely see the eventuality that content and DNS are going to get multiplexed and content providers and CDNs are going to be, you know, control points at that, at that point. And that's the only place can, that's going to be left to apply policies, really. Mm. And, and some sort of ecosystem would need to be thought about and how that would actually work. Yeah, I'm wondering if it's just going to stop the adoption of the newer protocols that are causing some of this, right? Uh, you know, part of this dependency on the muxing side and such is is curing the problem with ESNI, right? So a lot of the content control systems out there are dependent on uh, the transparent pro proxy functionality that's driving some of that. And so I'm wondering if folks are simply just going to not allow the stop, stop the conversations from happening if they're using the newer protocols. You know, that's certainly what China has chosen to do. And I will wonder, you know, if enterprises are just going to, you know, if you know, if your products, for instance, that are doing next gen firewall services are simply going to, you know, offer the option to stop, you know, proto higher end protocols from operating since they can't be, uh, you know, properly monitored. Yeah. And, and I don't think that's a good outcome either, right? No, it, it's not a great outcome, but I, I you know, I, I kind of fall into Paul Vixie's thoughts on this, that you're simply going to block it until, you know, there's a better way to operate it. Yep. My network by rules. Yes. Yeah. I can see Pat's put a question in the chat, uh, of Vinny. Uh, um, does this mean that, that the whole means of joining networks is defunct, e.g. Uh, DHCP or Slack, uh, as the choice of resolver is uh, um, uh, choice of resolver for sort of via DHCP, um, because uh, D DNS over quick would break captive portals as well. Yes, it, DNS over quick would definitely cause problems for captive portals. Um, I, I do know that the DOE would too, but the way the implementations are done, at least from talking with the device implementers, the OS implementers, is there's a captive portal phase that handles uh, trying to figure out if a captive portal is present. So it'll do the, the captive portal built into the OS, the detectors will fall back to like classic DNS and things like that. I assume with Doc, it would have to do something similar, like, hey, if we can't get any internet connectivity, there must be some captive portal. How do we fall back until we're able to negotiate through the captive portal? Yeah. Um, and and that, that whole phase, in my view, is the place to do this mutual consent negotiation where the network advertises what's acceptable to it in the list, and the client does the same, and if there's agreement, it just uses one of those selections out of the list. And if there isn't, then some user consent uh, mechanism happens where the user says, yeah, I'm going to use this network. And I understand they have sort of, you know, policies that I don't prefer, but I'm, I'm electing to participate and use this network. Or they say, no, these aren't acceptable. I don't want them looking at my content. I'm not going to join the network. And at least at that point, it's a good user experience as opposed to the, the current model, which is just whack-a-mole, block your dough. And when DOQ is multiplexed with content, it's going to get messy. Um, like I said, you can't just block an entire CDN. And so I, I don't even know how that's going to work. Yeah. Well, it certainly gets challenging then from a user experience uh, point. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've got a saying, question. Was that John? No, it's Chris. Chris. Okay. Okay. Um, can I just check before you dive in, Chris? I think you can. John had his hand raised. Oh, yeah. Um, 
<laughs> no, I, I suppose I, I'll, I'll voice the question to Vinny and see if he has an, an understanding or not an understanding, but a, an opinion on this. It seems like the misalignment of uh, expectations is really the root cause of the problem here that we're all trying to solve. There are, and, and what, what are the incentives for people to cooperate with any of these models? Um, it, it seems that a large portion of the encryption uh, debate is occurring um, to some degree because of the spark caused by misalignment of, of uh, incentives where the browser operator and a DNS provider were the ones to actually make the policy decisions. And then users more or less went along for the ride um, thinking that it's a good idea, but potentially that is in opposition to the incentives of their network operator. Do you envision that that model is somehow going to change where the incentives uh, or you know, the people who have the incentives to encrypt and the people who have the incentives to um, manage the network, uh, how do they fall in alignment? I don't, I don't see that happening. I see that in fact becoming more divergent. I agree with your latter part of your comment. I, I see this going really towards an arms race kind of model and nobody wins in that, right? So, um, that's why I, I, you know, I'd like to find a way to do some sort of collaborative security outcome where a user is able to make a choice, right? In, in most cases, I think it's just going to work, right? Because a user is not going to override their DNS settings. I think that's sort of a uh, nerd knob kind of thing. So most users are just going to get whatever the network advertises, but it, it's in these cases where that isn't the, isn't the case that is gonna become problematic. Um, and then when you do have a managed device that your enterprise manages, if you can't reach the services that they've provisioned on that device on a network, like what is that user experience gonna be? So uh, I, I do think this is just getting more and more difficult um, to operationalize. Uh, and I, I do think that some standards-based suggestions could maybe help here. Thanks. Okay, thanks, uh, John. Uh, so, Chris, you had a question. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, partly a comment, but I think, yeah, generally the this whole idea of negotiating between um, what what the what the end user wants and what the network wants it, it seems to be a, an elegant solution to this to this problem of yeah competing interest in an arms race yeah so i like it from that perspective um it's i mean one observation which i'd like to run past you is i th i think this if it was to be implemented it's, it applies to the whole scope of joining a network um, and it's not limited to DNS, is it? So it's, it's not really something that would be solved in a DNS working group. It, it's, it's a bit wider than that. Would you agree? Yeah, that's fair. I, I could envision where a user would want to be informed that a next gen firewall is inspecting the traffic. They may not even be aware of that, right? In today's... Um, typical enterprise network, there's transparent proxies that are inspecting your web traffic. You may not even be aware of it. You may not even know that there's a root CA on your device that's allowing them to man in, man in the middle of your traffic. Hmm. They may be man, man in the middle in your personal banking traffic because in today's world, especially with everyone working remotely, uh, it's not uncommon to be multitasking between work and personal tasks on the same device. And you know, it would be great at the point when you join a network to, to beyond just DNS, uh, I, I think these other filtering uh, aspects, I, I think the user being informed of those would be a, a better outcome in terms of privacy and they can decide, well, okay, I know, um, I know that my, traffic is being looked at and I don't feel comfortable like doing my banking. So I'm going to stop doing that on this device. Like mm. that's a perfectly great outcome. And uh, today it's, it, it isn't sort of, there's, there is, isn't any um, 
notification of that. So I do agree it could be bigger than DNS. I just do think DNS right now is, is really changing things the most, uh, meaning these content inspection things have existed for years. That's not new. But I think this shift in the DNS uh, model and infrastructure is mostly relevant because it's most impactful right now. I could um, also draw an analogy with this, with the, the uh, battle over data privacy, because we've got um, things like the current battle between Apple and Facebook. So Facebook are complaining that the Apple's um, being more transparent to the user about exactly what app data sharing policies are. Um, and now proposing to implement a dialogue where they um, prompt the user and say, do you consent to this? Um, and Facebook are not happy about that, but it's, it's, uh, it, it seems to be another way, a similar way of saying, look, transparently, here's what's going on. Um, do, you, do you accept this or not? Um, and it, to me, it seems yeah, better to negotiate such a thing um, or decide not to join the network than, than to have to be constantly battling this. Yes, uh, that, that, that's a great point. And I think that um, it's not enough to just say, well, the device will do something, right? If the network can't somehow confirm that this negotiation, like in cryptography as an example, I'll go back to that analogy. It's not a perfect analogy, but um, one side doesn't make the decision and both sides know the decision that was made, right? Mm -hmm. And so using that analogy, um, ideally, I, I don't want the device to just say, I'm doing this DNS and the network not know what that decision was because then again, you're back to whack-a-mole, right? Where you're just going to have to block everything except what you approve. And that's totally unmanageable as a solution. I'd rather the two entities somehow negotiate and are able to inform each other of the decision, like the, you know, in a, you know, analogous to a cryptographically negotiated outcome where, you know, there is a way to, to validate both sides have agreed to the same thing. The problem is that that allows defection, um, that you can still have entities inside your network decide that they're not going to cooperate and you're back to the same position. So it's a prisoner's dilemma where even one defector creates the worst possible outcome because the network operator is going to have to say, well, if it is possible for someone to violate my security model, then I must apply the most stringent uh, filtering that I possibly can. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I, I think if we can do it early enough in the the phase you join, maybe you don't get assigned an IP address because you didn't negotiate those uh, settings, right? And agree to those settings. So you just not issued an IP address on the network. Um, to me, that would be the phase where you could possibly do this. But I do agree if you can just put a device in the network and, you know, and bypass all of these negotiations, then it doesn't solve anything. So hopefully it's something we could do earlier in the uh, IP assignment phase of network joining. And to that end, I think you, you may have seen in the chat, Paul has sort of just it intimated that um, it is bigger than DNS and that ECH is also part of this problem space, which I think is a fair comment. And I guess it, that what you just said there, Vinnie, harks back to Pat's point about um, when you actually sort of join the network, uh, you know, be it through DHCP or whatever. It's almost at that point, ideally. Well, I wish Glenn were here to kind of speak to that point, right, is, is we had a gigantic argument when we formed ADD, right, about what the scope of ADD was. And that was, you know, that was, this was part of that argument space, but I think we all still agree that this problem exists and we may, you know, we may have to reapproach IETF on this issue. 
uh, more directly. Um, I also would like to make the point that the devices themselves are schizophrenic. Uh, you have, you know, if you look at uh, running Firefox on an Apple device, we now have two different groups that have a, a strong opinion on this space. You know, especially in how the DNS client, you know, the the, uh, the stub resolver operates, right? Now we have an application that's that's doing DNS and we have an operating system that's providing encrypted DNS services as well. And they both have a different policy decision on how that should operate. Yeah, and imagine even if you are a device owner trying to manage those two policies, right? Um, yes. It's not like you can do one policy setting and both components are going to follow that. You have to have a browser policy setting and a device policy setting. And that becomes fragmented across OSs and it gets fragmented across uh, browsers. And now you might have 10 or 15 completely different settings that you have to set just to select a common DOS server, right? So let's just say we all are, you know, 100% on the DOE bandwagon, which, you know, I am personally, I think it's great just to configure that uh, uh, is a nightmare, right? There's, there really isn't a great solution there. And, um, you know, hopefully the, the, the stuff we are doing in ADD, all of the components above the stack would leverage that for the configuration and not have to worry about separate configuration in each of these uh, different components because it very quickly fragments when you multiply the OSs and browser offerings that are out there. So yes, that's a great point. Of course, that's for the well-behaved applications and OSs of, of any, let alone the ones that maybe don't give the user a choice <laughs> uh, and just do it anyway. Um, um, so I can see, again, just looking in the chat, um, I think Joey, yeah, concurs that the with Paul's point about maybe needing to uh, rethink uh, re rethink the um, uh, ADD charter, um, uh, which, which it, in in fairness, I, I know when we did the uh, charter, it was largely a case of what we thought would get consensus. Um, so that was a bit of a calculation as to um, what might be acceptable. Um, to the group as a whole. Now, whether that's changed sufficiently in the last uh, nearly 12 months that uh, um, that could be re refined, um, I, I guess would need to be tested. Because um, I think it went as far as it could last time, um, but it's entirely possible that the group has mellowed collectively since then. Uh, and something more ambitious might, might be practicable. Um, well, I guess that'd be discussion for the new year with our two co-chairs to see if they were up for such a thing to happen. Hey Glenn, if you happen to watch this recording, I think we would all love to hear your opinion on, on this particular topic here, especially in context of, of Vinny's excellent uh, explanation here. Hi Andrew, it's Neil here. Just a, just, just a quick comment from myself. So first of all, thanks Vinny for um, the presentation. I thought it framed the, the, the current standing very well. Um, just wonder whether you've given any thought to the way that Doe was, uh, you know, quickly uh, abused in, in terms of uh, malware uh, after it was launched, whether this opens up further attack surface in terms of the use of uh, DOQ and, and, and whether there's any implications in its in its adoption that opens up that abuse even further with more channels to have to have to consider in terms of the you know c2 type traffic etc that, that that doe opened up for for enterprises yeah the reality is i can build malware that uses twitter or um, slack or any sort of approved uh, application as a command and control, right? So there's, you know, there's examples of those actually having been built. Um, and, you know, I've always been skeptical, like was the latest solar winds, what, whoever the attacker uh, 
wanted us to see, meaning they, they seem to be a little bit brazen in just using you know DNS the way they did as opposed to trying to obfuscate that. So I don't think Doe or uh, Doc um, changes that really. Uh, bad actors can do bad things over any protocol and they don't have to use standards-based protocols. They could completely craft their own relay system using another mechanism to do DNS, right? So uh, I don't think it changes that. I, I do think it leaves enterprises less comfortable because they're losing more and more visibility. And as a result, I think policies are being more, hey, okay, we're gonna tunnel everything back to the enterprise and we're gonna look at everything now because we, we're, we're losing these controls. So if we can't man in the middle it or somehow get at least net flow records of it, um, we're not even gonna allow you to do it, right? So uh, I think it's more just the paranoia and, and if the solar winds issue hasn't you know, made that even more obvious, I, I don't know what would, I mean, you know, major networks were infiltrated with this and you know, the networks weren't the thing that was infected, it was the endpoints, right? And so network operators are gonna be less trusting of endpoint devices, even when they manage them, right? Because this was legitimate software that was hacked and you could put these kind of backdoors in open source software and legitimate software that's private as well. Um, so yeah, I, I do think as visibility goes down, the enterprise uh, appetite to adopt those protocols goes down and the stringency and policies that get put in place are gonna go up. So yes, I, I, I do see that. Although, as I said, the bad actors didn't need to use standards protocols to be bad actors. Yeah. Well, because I, I know we've had this discussion, so we collectively, not you and I specifically, Vinny, uh, in, in, in the past. I think the point that was made to me was um, the malware writers, if you if you exclude the state actors, uh, a lot of the malware uh, writers are relatively lazy. So if there's a convenient library that they can use, they'll use that rather than craft their own from, from scratch. Um, so that's why they maybe use Do uh, okay. currently because it's convenient um, rather than because they have to. I think, you can guarantee, I think you can guarantee that if they, if they, if they could no longer use those standards based protocols uh, and wanted to, to, to circumvent stuff anyway, they would write it themselves. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah that, that, that's equally fair. Um, yeah. If, they, if they're clever enough to execute gadgets and exploits, they're not going to have an issue writing a library to do DNS if they really want to. Yeah. Um, I can see a question. I think I saw a question in the chat from Joey. Um, I think. Ah, oh, it's a question to Paul, actually, which Paul may have answered subsequently, but let me just check. Um, yeah, let me kind of rephrase that if you don't mind. Um, so I kind of made an assertion here that I don't think DNS over quick as a standard, you know, kind of what drove this whole conversation here is going to get adopted. I really don't see it being adopted because most of the clients, the when Doe won, it was primarily because of adoption by the operating system vendors and the browser vendors. And almost all of them are, have, are using kind of a unified HTTP stack. So it's not, you know, if we look at like Apple, they're providing a stack to the operating system that anything can use. And when, uh, you know, DNS over HTTP or when HTTP three is available by default in that stack, they're just going to start using that stack and not adopt DOQ at all. There's not a, a reason for them to adopt DNS over quick. Ex you know, that explicit version when they get the same thing out of DNS over HTTP three, which includes quick. Okay. Yes, although I, I, whether it's Doc or Doe, the multiplexing issue is still relevant in my mind. Absolutely. Mean, meaning I definitely can see content and DNS being multiplexed. What protocols are doing that may, may end up being Doe and HTTP3 and quick, but 
I do see the inevitability of that multiplexing, especially CDNs, right? If they're already housing the, the assets of an enterprise, uh, uh, of an entity, um, you know, the main domain and all the subdomains and all the related domains, all of those addresses can be served back with the content of the initiating domain. So to me, that's just a, an inevitable outcome that I, that I see coming very quickly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah those are all good points. So hopefully, Jerry, that answers your question. Uh, yes, I think it does. I just scrolled down <laughs> to see that. So, so thank you. It does. Thank you. <laughs> Right, so anyone else got any observations or questions uh, for Binny based on uh, what you've heard? I'm just wondering, that, that point on the malware was quite interesting as well. So uh, basically people are kind of expecting that people will be writing like their own DNS libraries at some point and use that for targeted uh, malware attacks, right? But have there been any instances of anything like that yet? Has anybody come across anything like this yet? Yes, that's been done. All right. So, and it's, I think it was God, Godlua, was it? The, the, the malware that um, made use of DOH first, if I remember correctly. But um, I, 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 the, the, the next question is how long before uh, Doc gets, gets abused or it just opens up another another channel or another potential attack surface to be to, to be leveraged and what that what that implication has that was that was the, the premise of the question Vinny really and whether you know that had been given any thought in and amongst how you know the, the more the more protocols that are opened up the more the more opportunity there is for abuse and the more there is to have to monitor to lock down oh no doubt uh, yeah but again you know I, I still a, a bad actor is gonna will write their own protocol if they have to like it's, you had the perfect DNS detection system that caught every bad actor, then they would just not use DNS, they'd use something else. So, yeah. um, but I do think these protocols do absolutely, you know, cause enterprises to have to, so I don't want to say draconian because they're not necessarily draconian, but they have to take harder looks at what they're going to allow for protocols on their network. And Chris, I can see he's just put some comments in the chat um, about maybe some positives of Doc over Doe um, in, in terms of it using a well-known port. So it could be explicitly bot blocked because it's not sort of hiding the traffic quite so well. I'll leave you to read that at, at your collective leisure. I think the fact that it uses a well-known port means it's less likely to get implemented by some parts of the industry, though. Yeah. Okay, and Paul uh, has raised his virtual hand in the chat. So, Paul, over to you. Uh, hello, good morning. Good afternoon to those of you in uh, England. So, to the observation that a malware author can write their protocol any way they wish. That is, has always been true. And so when somebody from the security industry demonstrates a concern about, let's say DOH, DOQ, uh, they're not saying, gee, this has never been possible for it before. It can we please not make it possible now? Um, rather, we're saying, this has never been the norm. Uh, can we please not have it be the norm? Because you know, the, there's been, you know, the, the defenders of uh, apps, kernels, hosts, networks uh, have been brutally underprovisioned and uh, underpowered for their struggle. And so what they've they've done is they've um, started to rely on things that are going to sound pretty corny to you to pretty uh, flaky like uh, I can't believe your county you're depending on that uh, but we are not because we love it but because it's what we have and we don't have much um, 
and we're doing anomaly detection. Yeah, so as an example, if if something never makes a DNS request that we can see in the firewall, um, but it nevertheless makes connections, either TCP or perhaps the new UDP flow, if it's going to be HTTP3 or DOQ, um, we might wonder how did it get the address that it is now directing this flow to? Uh, it doesn't need you know need DNS to understand its endpoint, but to get to the far end, it had to do something. And if it did something we can't see, then that's unusual. That is something that we know uh, we got to put that in a human loop. We got to put that in a in, in a ticket queue that somebody is going to go look at that device and find out what it's doing. Um, and in the in a world full of DOQ, DOH, uh, sort of things we can't see, it won't be the the malicious people will not be the only ones who never appear, appear to make a DNS query. Uh, it'll be everything. And I realize that hiding in a crowd, both a crowd of entropy and a crowd of other users uh, to doing the same thing, is what you have to have for effective security against nation states. Uh, but just to, to really uh, answer the, the, the point, we know that bad guys could have done this or similar things at any time in history. And that's not an issue for us. It's when everybody's doing it that it becomes a bit of a problem. Thank you. Sorry to go on at length. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, I think that's the hard bit <laughs> when everything's an anomaly. Uh, and in fact, that's the, the uh, theory behind ECH, of course, um, to hide in the crowd. Um, that's a, the, the, the design criteria. OK, anyone who's got any observations or questions on that before we move on? Take that as not. So thanks, Vinny. I think uh, that was a thought provoking uh, presentation. Uh, so much appreciated. I'm sure that discussion will continue uh, well after this call. And I guess we're all look forward to um, Glenn's response to uh, Paul's, uh, Paul Adair's, that is, a hostage video uh, recording in the middle. It'd be interesting to see when, when he sees that. Uh, uh, Fun. So thank you uh, for, for that. Let's uh, move on. Um, so other things I wanted to highlight, which you are hopefully aware of, uh, those of you that have yet to do your um, responses to Mozilla's uh, TRR public consultation, well, I'm sure we'll be delighted to know that the uh, consultation period has been extended to the 20th of January. Um, and in the uh, uh, email sent out, to the list this morning um, with some of the sort of pressure and up. You'll see a link there um, to the announcement, but it's uh, extended to the 20th. So you haven't got to write it uh, whilst eating turkey um, uh, later this week. Um, so I think the collective sign of relief from everyone um, on that. Um, secondly, uh, one of the topics that we will pick up um, in the new year which I've discussed sort of partially offline with Joey is uh, we go slightly off topic and uh, we'll, we'll have a call focused on centralization probably towards the uh, end of January. Um, so we have a mini uh, panel discussion followed by questions for those of you that have an interest in, in centralization, which has sort of got some connection to uh, encrypted DNS and, and as well as other topics. So, uh, expect more details on that um, in early January but if that's of interest and you want to be involved in some way then just uh, contact me offline uh, uh, on that please. Um, if I can read my, my own writing. Ah, um, also, since Glenn isn't on the call, uh, just a reminder, something he mentioned from a couple of weeks back, um, because ITF 110 is um, early in March, um, so time is, is moving on quite quickly on sort of making progress. So hopefully in the new year, there is going to be some debate around calls for adoption for 
both use cases and potentially some solutions uh, papers. Um, but it was really just a reminder to people, if you want to be involved in the sort of production of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of drafts, um, that the uh, sort of date for submission to ITF 110 will be, I think, around the third week of February for the cutoff, uh, which is soon uh, in the overall scheme of things. So do bear that in mind. Um, uh, and also, as you've probably seen on the ITF list, uh, registration is already open for um, 110 for those of you that are planning to uh, register um, for the uh, event. Um, but uh, I think uh, come early January, we'll need to put some focus into the, sort of the solution side um, on the assumption that the use cases uh, is indeed adopted. Uh, so, uh, so focus on that in the new year. Um, and then the final thing from me was simply to say that after today, the next next in these calls will be on the 4th of January. Um, so uh, if anyone that was anticipating a call uh, next Monday, um, manage your, your disappointment. Uh, I'm sure you'll have plenty of other better things to do um, than, than this next week. Okay, so that was just quickly a few few things from me. Anyone got any comments on any of those or any other points that you think would be timely to bring up and share with others? And now would be a good time to do so. Give a moment collectively to think. Can't see any raised hands in the participant list or in the chat. That as no, do I can I assume that we, we have finished for today, just coming up to the hour, so it's good timing if we are. Take it that we have all right. Well, that's fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks particularly to Vinny for uh, that presentation and for stimulating a very interesting uh, conversation, uh, quite wide ranging. Food for thought uh, as we uh, consume large quantities of turkey, for those of us in the UK, and don't go anywhere at all because we can't. So <coughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for inviting me. I enjoyed presenting and enjoyed the very thought-provoking questions. So, Brilliant. okay. So, thanks Talk everyone. To everyone soon. Thank Have you. a great, great break over Christmas, and see you uh, on the fourth of January. So, have, have a great uh, time off. Thanks all. Have a nice Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.